Pro means big or large scale. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at nutrition, which is kind of large scale nutrients, which ultimately needs to be digested. Now, I'm aware that you guys are studying this a great deal in biology, and you're looking at the both the chemical and mechanical digestion, you look at enzymes. We're not gonna to touch on that today. We really wanna look at the three, what you guys refer to as substrates, and then we want to consider their role in kind of energy provision, but also in the adaptation process. So I'm gonna introduce you to three macronutrients. Number one is carbohydrates. Very familiar, familiar to us. We're talking about our potatoes, we're talking about our pasta, we're talking about some vegetables, we're talking about rice carbohydrates they are responsible for energy provision in the body in fact carbohydrates specifically glucose which carbohydrates are broken down into is the preferred energy source for every cell in the human body okay so therefore carbohydrates are preferred they're also particularly important for higher intensity exercise particularly for higher intensity exercise and we'll come to that, back to that point when we look at fats in a moment Furthermore, they can be stored in the body and they are stored as glycogen. So I just want to be clear here. When we, let's say we eat a bowl of rice for argument's sake, right? We break that rice down, we digest it, we form it into glucose, which is then um, absorbed in the small intestine. And then if we're not going to use it immediately, we will store it as glycogen. And we can store it in two places. We can store it in muscle tissue. Now, it's no surprise because, of course, we could use that energy to power movement. But we also store the biggest store of this in the liver. So most of our glycogen is stored in the liver. <clears throat> and finally, if I come back to the uh, high intense activity, it's the source of energy for both. Let me just come down here. For both. I wonder if you know what I'm going to write here. And I'm going to write aerobic and anaerobic exercise. Now, if you consider our studies of aerobic and anaerobic exercise back on paper one, we would have said that it, for the aerobic exercise, glucose, uh, sorry, um, glucose, yes, in the presence of oxygen, uh, goes to uh, H2O, CO2, and energy release. And of course, the anaerobic version, we're talking about uh, glucose in presence of insufficient oxygen go to lactic acid plus energy release. In both cases, carbohydrates, specifically glucose, is the energy source for those systems okay so that's what we want to understand there let's go secondly to our fats now of course you folks you know your fats as lipids and yes in your biology you talk about the breakdown of lipids into fatty acids and glycerol but what we're going to stress here is that they are a source of energy and you might be thinking well hang on a minute james you just said that glucose is the preferred energy source for both forms of exercise that's absolutely true but this energy is particularly important for low intensity activity so if you do for example a very long slow walk not necessarily slow but you know like moderate intensity that intensity is going to be driven largely by the processing of fat and the reason that is is because fat just takes longer to process but it's actually quite efficient once it's processed or oxidized okay the other things that fat will fats will do for us they will insulate so they are providing insulation of organs and if you um if you were to think about the heart for example if you think about any of the soft tissue internal soft tissues they are largely surrounded by a layer of fat for insulation purposes but also, of course, we have insulation for sort of thermoregulation under the skin. Now, we have a layer of fat, all human beings do, under the skin, especially around the butt, especially around the waist, especially around the torso. And that, what that does is it's what we call a subcutaneous fat layer, and it keeps the body warm, okay? So, you know, we don't have as much as a Atlantic seal would have. They have much thicker because um, uh, fat layer because, of course, they're in a much colder environment. But we need that to keep us warm in, you know, when we're exposed to cold air, for example, and deep cold water although it will not protect us against very very cold air or very very cold water um, those things can kill people of course now i've just said subcutaneous subcutaneous fat all i mean by that is it's stored under the skin okay subcutaneous it's a lovely word I'll, I'll write it in for you this by no means a required term of you but i'll mention that to you subcutaneous literally means under the skin so feel free to use it if you uh, if you want to and as i said before it's a source of energy at low intensity but specifically for the aerobic system now you might be thinking hang on a minute jimbo you said glucose in the presence of oxygen goes to that is absolutely true but an alternative fuel source the aerobic system are lipids okay so it absolutely is a fuel source it's got a whole other process called beta oxidation we're not going to get into it 
here. Now our third category of macronutrient is our protein. And I'm gonna be honest with you, this is the one that I get particularly excited about because they are stunning in their structure. They are a 3D molecule chain of amino acids, sometimes hundreds of amino acids. But what we use proteins for is we use them for things like muscle growth. So just to be clear, you might eat, let's say a, a piece of fish, you digest that protein, you, you probably realize in the stomach the proteases do that, you study this in biology, and then you ingest that into the bloodstream in your small intestine. Now those individual amino acids have been broken down and they then go to the cells where they're reconstructed into human protein, for example, muscle filaments. What an incredible process that actually is. And guys, I cannot stress enough, if you want to know the wonders and miracles of the universe, you wouldn't go far wrong in studying proteins, to be perfectly honest with you. They are stunning. Anyway. I'll try and hold back my enthusiasm for proteins just here. Uh, but yes, they're involved with muscle repair. Yes, they're also really good to consume after exercise. And if you want a little tip here, and again, check your labels and all this sort of stuff, about 30 grams of protein post-exercise is a nice sort of aim to go for. Any more than that doesn't seem to be absorbed efficiently, but of course this will then help with muscle growth and muscle repair, in other words, the adaptation process. Um, some people use supplements, you know, effectively protein shakes, and these seem to make the process faster. Okay, so that seems to be really good. Now, peptide, um, they're often what are called peptide chains, okay? And pept uh, the bonds between the amino acids are actually peptide bonds, and that's why you might see a, pept a peptide protein supplement in case you come across that. And then final things, if you take these, you can train more quickly, which is why athletes do use these structures. And finally, they can increase protein synthesis. Now, I'm hoping you hear the term protein synthesis, which I've written horribly down this bottom corner. And you must be thinking immediately about your ribosomes in biology, right? Ribosomes is the location of protein synthesis. So you guys know where this happens. We don't need to worry about that for here. But you guys know that's in those microscopic ribosome organelles in every single cell of the human body. That's our micronutrients. Hope it's useful. Cheers.